Hello, I'm Kent Myers. I'm Mick Cornett, and it's time for the verdict. As a part of its traditional and continuing commitment to public and community service, Crow and Dunleavy Law Firm presents The Verdict, an objective discussion of contemporary legal issues hosted by Kent Myers. And also brought to you by a friend of Oklahoma Lawyers for Children and Delta Dental Plan of Oklahoma. And welcome to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett, and today we're back for part two of our look at Oklahoma's Indian tribes, the laws, the customs, and in some way, we hope to answer some questions that a lot of people have and to lead the discussion. As always, let me introduce one of Oklahoma's top legal experts and my co-host, Kent Myers. Mick, uh, it's, it's good to be back on this show and I'm back on this subject, a uh, very interesting subject. Uh, you have two citizenships. You're a citizen of the state of Oklahoma, which is a sovereign. You're, the cit you're a citizen of the United States, which is a sovereign. Indians in Oklahoma have tri-citizenship. They are citizens of the state, the federal government, or the United States, and their own tribe. And that brings about some interesting uh, issues. Uh, we are just peppered in Oklahoma with tribes. I have a graphic that I'd like for us to look at just at the moment to show uh, without the benefit of towns listed thereon. There are 39 or 40, depending on who you talk to, tribal offices in Oklahoma or places of uh, uh, that are the headquarters for a number of tribes in Oklahoma, more here than anywhere else in the United States. And uh, the, uh, the uh, tribes have an enormous influence, both economically and politically, and the people we've brought here today to continue our discussion, of course, are the people we had on our last week's show. And uh, they will continue to tell us about the interesting things that uh, are that come to pass when the tribes start interacting mm -hmm. with state and federal governments. And I know you're going to get into gaming today. We promise we're going to get into gaming. We promised it last week and <laughs> didn't quite make it, but we will get into gaming early on this week. Well, let's take a break and then we can get started. It's an interesting topic. Oklahoma's Indian tribes will get started with our special guest when we return on The Verge. I enrich our cultural landscape. I help define our quality of life. I am one of 4,000 artists in central Oklahoma who receive support from Allied Arts, this community's united arts organization. I am. I am. I am an Allied artist. It's got to be around here somewhere. Don't worry, we'll find it. Just calm down. I swear it was right here on the desk. All right, if I were a Will, where would I be? It's the only copy. Without it, we're out three million. I know, I know. Hey, accidents happen. If a condom breaks or you have unprotected sex. You have 72 hours to reduce your risk of getting pregnant. It's called emergency contraception. Got questions? Call Planned Parenthood. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all of the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children has over 350 of the best attorneys and volunteers in Oklahoma County who donate their time and services to represent children. For more information, call 405-23-CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. And welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and we're ready to discuss the issues involving Oklahoma's Indian tribes. Kent? 
Welcome back to The Verdict is Right. Welcome back to the two guests we had last week. And I want to reintroduce them for the uh, viewers. Uh, on my right is the Honorable uh, Enoch Kelly Haney, State Senator from Seminole, and uh, probably best known, he has a lot of accolades, but probably best known, as we said last week, for being the world-renowned sculptor that was selected to uh, handle the, the creation of the Guardian, which will be on top of the Capitol Dome, a wonderful uh, memorial to our Indian population to be overlooking where all of our uh, seat of government is located. But Senator Haney, thanks for coming back. Thank you very much. And a longtime friend of mine from law school and after, uh, uh, Ross Swimmer from Tulsa, uh, principal chief of the Cherokees, uh, head of Bureau of Indian Affairs, and a uh, 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 president, a chief executive officer of Cherokee Industries, I believe. Yes. Glad to have you back, Ross. Thank you. Uh, when we stopped last time because of time, uh, we were discussing the general subject of are Indians paying their fair share uh, because of such things as license plates and all, and I, and I think we really probably didn't scope that out as much as we can. Uh, Ross, could you comment on that? Because I think there's some concepts about that that, our, that I certainly was not aware of and our viewers may not be. Sure. Uh, I recall uh, Senator Haney talking about this uh, last week involving the, uh, the school funding, for one thing. The tribes, though, bring into the state of Oklahoma several hundred million of dollars. And it's everything federal from dollars. federal dollars that, that come in that would not be here but for these Indian tribes. Uh, as the senator mentioned, in schools, it, it is title money, it's Johnson O'Malley money, it's impact aid money. Uh, we uh, have been responsible for a substantial number of roads that have been paved in rural Oklahoma, probably as much as some counties have, in fact. Uh, things like uh, health care, uh, with just the hospitals alone that are funded by Indian Health Service, it's well over $150 million. Uh, housing uh, is a, another uh, $100 million plus uh, budget. Uh, I know the Cherokee Nation, for instance, is currently managing, I, I think it's between uh, eight and 10,000 housing units. And uh, all of the tribes have their housing authorities, and I would guess there are probably 25, 30,000 housing units that have been built as a result of tribal funding from the federal government. So all of these, uh, in, it's sort of in lieu of taxes. You know, if they yeah. say the tribe isn't paying its fair share on sales tax or license tax or whatever, it, it more than offsets in what the tribes bring into the state of Oklahoma. In fact, I, I would guess it's close to 20 percent of the, the budget of Oklahoma. It's kind of off budget, but it's money that that is there because of these tribes. Senator Haney, what do you think about that? Um, the numbers I saw four years ago showed that tribally owned businesses and Indian owned businesses employed somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 percent of the population. When you consider we have 8% of the population, mm -hmm. it simply means that the number of non-Indian people who work for Indian-owned businesses or Indian tribes is much more than the population. So when we talk about equality, I think the Native people, when you look at the numbers, really do participate and share in the economy. And also the, the total gross uh, products that are uh, sold through Indian tribes and Indian-owned businesses are substantially more than their population. So when you look at the real dollars, I think you, you begin to see the impact that the tribes have. And, and one other point, so many national owned businesses in Oklahoma, at the end of the day, uh, somehow that money gets back to headquarters outside of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. All the native tribes are located right here in the state of Oklahoma. Yeah, that's why I put the graphic up at the beginning to show yeah. where, the, where the headquarters were. That's right, so when, when the money hits here, Unfortunately, with the exception of those few businesses we talk about that the Native people have, most businesses are not owned by Native people. So when the dollars come into the community, they touch those five to six hands, depends upon what the economy is. It hits all of those hands, which basically are not Native people. So the economy of any local community where tribes are located is substantially increased uh, because of tribes being in that area. That's a good good synopsis that we didn't have before. Let's go back to something that uh, Ross Swimmer mentioned in the first show, which I, I loved his, uh, his uh, phrase of uh, uh, sin, sin dollars, or sin business. Uh, let's talk about gaming. I'm not suggesting it is or is not uh, sin. sin, but uh, <laughs> uh, 
Indian tribes are engaged in, uh, in quite a bit of gaming activity. Uh, there are approximately 28 Indian casinos in Oklahoma, and we have three classes of gaming that I'd like to bring a graphic up and, and talk about. Just briefly, we won't talk about each one, but class one is social games played for minimal prizes. Class two is bingo, pull tabs, etc., when played at the same location as bingo. And then class three is all forms of gaming that are not one and two. Uh, what, what impact does Indian gaming have on the... Uh, economics of the tribal operation, Ross? Well, it's pretty significant in Oklahoma now, even though, uh, as your graphic showed, Oklahoma tribes are limited to class two yes. gaming, which are, is essentially bingo or games similar to bingo, and, and in some cases you even see machines that look like slot machines, but technically they're a bingo type machine. Uh, most of the tribes use it as a form of, of uh, raising money for other projects, for educational projects, for uh, improving health care and that kind of thing. Generally speaking, the return on gaming is about 10%. So if you've got a $50 million a year bingo hall, it would uh, provide the tribe with about $5 million of income that they could then use on whatever programs they want, but in many cases it's supporting tribal government and then paying for social programs. I'd say it's an industry that in Oklahoma alone accounts for about um, anywhere from three to four hundred million dollars of gross revenues. Senator Haney, <coughs> the legislature uh, this session uh, uh, enacted a resolution that will send lottery to a vote of the people, or it did not. Did not. Uh, right. did, uh, turned it down, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. but considered it. Uh, we have discussed lottery on other shows, but let's assume that lottery passed in Oklahoma. What effect, if any, would that have on the gaming operations of the Indian casinos? Would that open it up to uh, Las Vegas-style uh, casinos? I, th I think there are probably different opinions on that. My, my opinion is that it probably would. Uh, and again, uh, I'm, I'm talking from the standpoint of a person who deals with the creation of legislation but not being an attorney. That causes me a little problem. But I, I think from my understanding of what the law is, I think it would do that. I'd like to give these two guys an opportunity to say anything to the audience for just a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds each, that they'd okay. like to say about Indian issues or, uh, or tribal sovereignty at all. Uh, Senator Haney, why don't we start with you? Okay. Uh, when I look at the amount of dollars that come in as a result of Native people, that may explain some of the growth in Oklahoma. There are 22 states in this last session that looked at the possibility, and some did, cutting budgets severely in, in their state budgets because, and, and so much of it was for higher education and education in general, which no one wants to do. Oklahoma's economy is very strong, uh, mostly with natural resources and services. The manufacturing is basically uh, stable, but the, uh, the amount of dollars that we expected this year far exceeded mm -hmm. what we had planned to. So the economy in Oklahoma is strong, and I think the personal income increase was one that was encouraging. And, and, I, and I think to some degree you might uh, consider the possibility that the amount of dollars that come in as a result of tribal governments may help to, uh, to strengthen the economy in Oklahoma. Well, let me interject. We'll come back and have Mr. Swimmer's comments. We'll be right back. You're watching The Verdict with Mick Cornett and Kent Myers. not just girls. But hey, campfire's definitely for kids. So call the campfire office nearest you to join in on the fun. Because let's face it, you're not getting any younger. St. Gregory's University has been changing the lives of people like me for 125 years. Affordable, private Catholic education, balanced with dedication to community and service, makes St. Gregory special. We're extremely proud of our students' outstanding academic achievements and our nationally ranked athletic teams. It's when you help a student build a future of balance, integrity, and service that you change a life forever. St. Gregory's, a community for life. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the, of the United, United States, States of America and to and the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, and justice. justice for all. Every day Americans make this pledge, but few think about its significance. It's our job to make justice a reality by providing legal representation for all citizens. Legal services, keeping the promise of America. Every day, in state governments throughout the country, crucial decisions are being made that affect the lives of children and their families. But as this process takes place, children are often left voiceless. When these children raise their hands to be heard, is anyone listening? There are people listening. They are child advocates. Join us and raise your hand for kids. We're discussing Oklahoma's Indian tribes. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett, Kent Myers, and we're going to give Mr. Swimmer a chance now to say anything you'd like to to our viewers that maybe you've just never had the opportunity to discuss before. This kind of a program could go on for hours if you give someone an <laughs> opening like that. I'll try to keep it short. See what you can do in a minute and a half. <laughs> there, Oklahoma is a unique state in regard to the American Indian. It was a state that was never to be. It was supposed to be set aside for tribes, and as a result of that, we have 39 or 40 tribes that have been moved here for one reason or another from all over the country, from New York to Arizona to uh, the south part of the country. One of the things that makes Oklahoma unique in that regard is tourism, and somehow or other, uh, we need to capitalize on that. It's an important asset to Oklahoma. The second thing is we talked a little bit about development. Just to mention, one of the reasons why uh, we have power plants and lots of energy in Oklahoma today is because of some tax legislation that was passed on behalf of tribes. And if you live in a state with Indian tribes and you're on reservation, you get to take advantage of it. But in Oklahoma, virtually the whole state is eligible because it was a former Indian reservation. And some legislation I worked on along with uh, Congressman Watkins a few years ago, we managed to further define that definition in Oklahoma. And as a result, there are things like accelerated depreciation, uh, tax credits for employment, that sort of thing. Those wouldn't be here if it weren't for the Indian tribes. There are a lot of uh, opportunities in Oklahoma uh, for the state and the tribes to work together. We're seeing this in the terms of water compacts. We're seeing it with license tag compacts. We're, we're talking about having two sovereigns in the same area, covering the same territory. So I think that's what makes us unique. But the one thing I found several years ago, I was asked to do a speaking tour in Germany about the American Indian. What I found is that Europeans come to the United States to see the American Indian. Hmm. They don't come to see their relatives or ancestors. <laughs> they want to see something unique. They don't want to see Mickey Mouse and Pluto. They want to see something <laughs> they, they totally want American. To, they want to see our real history, and that's the American Indian. And so we've just We've just scratched the surface of that in Oklahoma, and as uh, Senators mentioned, uh, uh, the new uh, museum that's being built here in Oklahoma City, uh, Chalagi over in Tahlequah, uh, our museums in Tulsa, they all have a focus of the American Indian, and that, I think that's going to prove very, very valuable to Oklahoma and to the tribes in the future. Mm -hmm. Senator Haney, let me uh, change the subject just a minute, and let's talk about the Bureau of Indian Affairs for a second. Uh, Recently, uh, another Oklahoman, Neil McCaleb, was confirmed to be head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, had been appointed by uh, uh, President Bush. Uh, is that a benefit to Oklahoma Indians and Oklahoma Indian tribes to have someone like Neil McCaleb in the position of Bureau of Indian Affairs chief? Well, first, when he asked for my support, I first asked him why he would want to do that. <laughs> That's a very, very <laughs> difficult job and one that uh, require some patience, but uh, I have every confidence that Neil McCaleb will do an excellent job and as good a job as anyone can do in that particular environment, in that kind of situation. Uh, I think the fact that there are many Oklahoma tribes supporting him in this effort was also uh, beneficial to, to the Oklahoma tribes because eventually, you know, whatever benefits there are to Oklahoma, I think, uh, I think will be good. Ross, you probably have more 
knowledge, uh, working knowledge of the Bureau of Indian Affairs than most, having headed that agency for three and a half years under President Reagan. Uh, how do you see Neil McCaleb's tenure uh, in, at the Bureau as being a benefit to Oklahomans and Oklahoma Indians? Well, in, in some ways it's, uh, it's a significant benefit because he knows the lay of the land. He knows tribes in Oklahoma. Uh, if I were the Chickasaw leader, I wouldn't be so excited because he'll be recused from anything that the Chickasaws want to do. He so Neil is to, a Chickasaw? To Chickasaw? He is Chickasaw. Uh, but Neil's a, a fine person. He's a, a good administrator. He's from Edmond, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, Neil has uh, been under the fire in state government. Uh, he'll certainly be under fire with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It's a love-hate relationship. Uh, the tribes will all uh, bless him when he gets there, and they'll all curse him the day after. So uh, <laughs> the, the Bureau, by its very nature, is a trustee. And the trustee has certain obligations to help manage the affairs of the of the ward, in essence, these tribes. And when they try to look out after the best interest of the tribes, tribes don't always like that. And so it's, uh, it's a very, very difficult job. And, and frankly, I, I think the Bureau should work itself out of business uh, sometime in the not too distant future. Well, I want to follow up on that comment because it was widely reported at some point during your tenure with the Bureau of Indian Affairs that you had uh, uh, a very Reagan-esque type of uh, view of the Bureau in that you headed it, but you'd like to see it abolished. Uh, is there any truth to that? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I, the, the one thing I managed to do was uh, get some legislation enacted that allowed the tribes to take the money from the Bureau. They could contract not just programs, because mo many of the programs had failed, but they could actually take the money from the Bureau. And uh, it's called self-governance, and that's one of the things that has lasted and continues to grow. And more and more tribes are taking the responsibility for their own well-being and uh, not looking to the Bureau. Uh, and they're doing much better. In fact, uh, if you're looking at an oil and gas deal, a tribe can go out and hire a consultant that knows what they're doing and get a much better deal than they can if they have to rely on the Bureau, because the Bureau is constrained. And, and who it can hire, uh, the expertise that they can hire. Uh, it's made up of, of wonderful people. I would not denigrate the Bureau's employees at all. Uh, they're great people, but uh, just a real quick anecdote. I had an area director in Montana, and he said, you know, the tribe has brought me a deal to promote uh, a huge amount of coal, and it's in the billions of dollars. And he said, I don't have a clue. <laughs> he said, I, you know, I've got to approve this as their trustee. And he said, I, I don't know what to do. So, uh, of course, the tribe had its own consultants and all, and they told us what they wanted to do, yeah. so we pretty much let them. But that's, that's where it should go. We're going to have to wrap it up. Okay. God, this time went fast. Senator Haney, Mr. Swimmer, thank you both for coming on the show, the, not only today, but also last week as well. I, we learned a lot. Kent and I will be back with a few final words. You're watching The Verdict with Mick Cornett and Kent Myers. My name is Ted Smith. I'm president of the board of directors of the Oklahoma Disability Law Center. ODLC provides free legal services in civil matters to people with physical and mental disabilities. I'm Mike Sykes, vice president of ODLC. For more information, call 1-800-880-7755. The Oklahoma Disability Law Center provides high quality legal services to people with physical and mental disabilities. In Oklahoma, there are more than 1,600 children waiting to be adopted. They're of all ages, and for many, home has been a source of pain and conflict. They've dreamed of finding a better life and a loving family. Consider adoption. For more information, call 1-877-OK-SWIFT or visit the website www.okdhs.org. Adopt. It may be the toughest job you'll ever love. Scouts of America, where above all else, character counts. Bringing out the best in each student, 
That is the simple goal and tradition of Heritage Hall. The focus on the individual shapes the educational experience at Heritage Hall. Each student benefits from small classes, able, dedicated teachers, a solid academic curriculum, and exceptional co-curricular programs of athletics, arts, community service, and other activities. Parental involvement, personalized counseling, and the development of responsibility, integrity, and love of learning. If you want education taught with pride, then you want Heritage Hall. Back to the verdict. Time for just a few final thoughts. Again, during the break, you and I were trying to come up with some famous Oklahomans who were Native Americans. And uh, from my background in sports, I guess I, I uh, gravitated toward Allie Reynolds and yes. Jim Thorpe and Andy Payne, the cross country runner. But of course, there's Sequoia, uh, the educational leader. And uh, it, it, one of the problems is when you make a list, you start leaving people out. Yes. So I'm going to call it off there, fully admitting that I've left a lot of very uh, well known and notable people out. But. There's another aspect to, to the importance of the Indian population in Oklahoma and the United States. President Franklin Roosevelt uh, said that all U.S. citizens are immigrants except the native Indians. So we're all, you, you're an immigrant, uh, as am mm -hmm. I, under that definition. Uh, our heritage uh, is so closely tied to that of the uh, Indian tribes. And uh, it, it, is, it is amazing uh, tension and intertwining of cultures. Uh, we've uh, lived for years with peaceful coexistence. At what price? Uh, it is really encouraging to see the Indian tribes taking more and more self-governance and, and making the need for uh, institutions such as the Bureau of Indian Affairs less and less. As Ross Swimmer said, the more the, uh, uh, the tribes govern themselves, the less there will be a need for an organization like the Bureau of Indian Affairs getting stronger, having a great positive impact in Oklahoma, and one that I think uh, I certainly, as an Oklahoman, uh, uh, always uh, have not thought enough about or appreciated enough, like I do appreciate these two guests. One last uh, thing I want to mention one more time uh, is, is the website of which we're very proud, www.theverdict.tv. Uh, there you can uh, Get on, see about the shows we have had, the shows we're going to have, mm -hmm. find out a little bit about secrets about uh, you and me. That, <laughs> well, they uh, can suggest show topics they if can, they'd like. And they can comment on shows that we have had, ask questions they want to have answered. Uh, we will respond to serious inquiries into the website <laughs> and probably some that aren't so serious. But uh, we're proud of it. Tune into it. Uh, look it up. And uh, let us be more responsive to what you, the viewers, want on the verdict. And with that, we'll call it an end. Thanks again to our guests, Ross Swimmer and Kelly Haney. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next time on The Verdict. This program was brought to you by Crow and Dunleavy, a professional corporation. And also brought to you by a friend of Oklahoma Lawyers for Children and Delta Dental Plan of Oklahoma.